This video is sponsored by Brilliant. The first 200 to use the link in the description get 20% off the annual subscription. On any given weekday, 5.9 million people take Hong Kong's public transportation. Of them, 5.894 million, or 99.9% .9 arrive on time. It's so efficient, so clean, and so convenient that virtually everyone uses it. If the US, with 800 cars per 1,000 people, has a car culture, Hong Kong, with only 92, has a culture of public transit. With the exception of the outlying islands, there's an easy way to get almost anywhere in the territory. On Hong Kong Island, the iconic and only fully double-decker tram system in the world costs just 2.3 Hong Kong dollars, or 30 US cents. Nearby, the peak tram takes you to the most spectacular view of the city in just 7 minutes, a steep 370 meter or 12,000 foot ascent that would otherwise take a full hour. You can cross over to Kowloon on the relaxing 120 year old Star Ferry. And when you leave Hong Kong, there's no need to take your bags to the airport. You can drop them in the city, then shop, eat, explore, and they'll automatically be sent to the airport, loaded onto your plane, and be there waiting for you wherever you arrive. There are buses, cable cars, helicopters, and the longest outdoor covered escalator in the world. Finally, the 12 line 93 station mass transit railway, or MTR, is responsible for moving most of the city's 7.5 million people. A special Mickey Mouse themed line goes to Disneyland, another to the racehorse on event days, and yet another crosses over into mainland China. It's no wonder more people take the MTR every single day than the entire population of Norway or Singapore. But unlike nearly every other place in the world, Hong Kong's public transit pays for itself. It's so profitable that it actually subsidizes the government, not the other way around. And its unique business model is an unexpected window into the city's ongoing protests. In most cities around the world, transit is seen as a public good. Like building roads or minting coins, buses and trains are not expected to be profitable. And while it's economically useful to get people to and from where they can make and spend money, there's less incentive to make it clean, quick, or comfortable. The problem is, especially in America, users of public transit are disproportionately young and poor, which is to say, not politically useful. In Tucson, Arizona, for example, every third rider of public transportation is in poverty, compared to 13% in the general population. Because of this, it's treated like social welfare, mostly for the poor, and subsidized by everyone. The simple way to measure how much money a system loses is to calculate its fare box recovery ratio, that is, the total amount made from rides divided by the cost to run it. The lowest, meaning least profitable cities, are almost all in the US. Detroit is 20%, Dallas is 14 and Santa Clara County is 10 In other words, tickets only pay for one-tenth of its expenses. The other 90% is subsidized, reluctantly, by local, state, and federal governments. An example of a high ratio is San Francisco's Bay Area Rapid Transit, at 70%, about the same as Berlin, Beijing, or Amsterdam. But then there's Hong Kong's MTR. Fares pay for 185% of its operating expenses, the highest in the world. In 2017, it generated 21.4 billion Hong Kong dollars of profit. And yet, somehow, it's still extremely affordable. To get from one side of Hong Kong Island to the other, from Chai Wan to Kennedy Town, costs just 10.7 HKD, or 1.3 US dollars. To go all the way from the border with mainland China to central is 50.5, or 6.4 US dollars. It's about half that for children, students, the elderly, and disabled. There are some obvious reasons Hong Kong has such a big transportation advantage. First, as one of the densest places on Earth, with, for example, 57,250 people per square kilometer, or 22,104 per square mile in the Kwantung District. Second, its infrastructure is relatively young. The London Underground opened in 1863, the New York Subway in 1904, and Hong Kong's MTR in 1979. But there's another secret ingredient to its success. The MTR is so profitable, despite being so affordable, by selling to businesses its biggest asset, access to the 90% of Hong Kong's population that takes the train. The MTR's real product is its ability to almost unilaterally decide where Hong Kongers go. 
Here's how it works. First, before construction takes place, the Hong Kong SAR government grants the company development rights around new stations. The MTR pays for the land, but at greenfield prices, meaning its value before the station is built. Then it builds the new line or station, which, because of the MTR's ubiquity, instantly makes the land in and around it much more valuable. Finally, it sells or leases that space to property developers. Over 1,400 shops are leased inside stations, and the areas above or around them are often partly owned by or in a profit-sharing agreement with the MTR. This includes the first and second tallest buildings in Hong Kong, the Four Seasons Hotel, the Ritz-Carlton, and about 50 others. It also attaches MTR-branded malls to popular stations. There's even a 50 high-rise, 21,000 apartment MTR neighborhood called Lohas Park. Because of this, it's quite possible to unknowingly spend your entire day sleeping, eating, shopping, and watching a film without technically leaving public transit. It's called the Rail Plus Property Strategy, and predictably, it's very profitable. In 2018, the company made 8.2 billion HKD from transit operations, meaning fares, but 12.7 from property development, rent, and commercial business. It then gives some of this money back as stock dividends to the government, who owns 75% of the company. By not relying on government funding, the MTR can maintain and grow its operations quickly as an efficient, market-based company. The government, meanwhile, sees transit not as an insatiable money pit, but an important source of revenue that it's actively incentivized to improve. For example, the MTR is legally required to report any delay longer than 8 minutes to the government, and a 31-minute delay results in a 1 million HKD fine. Trains are quiet and clean with a strict no eating or drinking policy. They arrive so often there is no need for a timetable. The Octopus card makes paying as easy as a single tap, and it also works in convenience stores, supermarkets, restaurants, vending machines, laundry machines, even parking meters. Finally, 75% of the population lives within one kilometer of a station. As great as it is, though, there is a catch. Looking at a map, Hong Kong looks like a tiny place for 7.5 million people. But behind the rows of skyscrapers, visible from almost anywhere in the territory, are luscious, green, undeveloped mountains. Hong Kong is very dense, but the problem isn't a lack of space. Almost three quarters of its land is green space. Only 25% is even developed, and a tiny 7% is residential. Of course, some of this land is mountainous and simply can't be developed but a significant portion sits unused or underused. For example, the sprawling 420-acre Fanling Golf Course is surrounded by rows of cramped 40-floor residential buildings. There's a simple economic reason housing is in such short supply. To attract businesses, Hong Kong has one of the lowest income tax rates in the world. Instead, it makes money from land leases. Aside from St. John's Cathedral in Central, which is privately owned by the Church of England, and a few 999-year leases like the U.S. Consulate, all land in Hong Kong is government-owned and leased, usually for 50 years. 27% of government revenue comes from land sales, which means it has little economic reason to flood the market with more supply, despite the intense need. Instead, it constrains supply by slowly auctioning off land while housing prices continue to skyrocket. A tiny 200-square-foot studio may cost 4 or 5 million HKD or 600,000 US dollars. The median annual salary is worth about 12 square feet. In this way, the MTR Corporation and the government, with their perverse incentives to restrict land rights and drive up prices, are, in part, responsible for a housing crisis in which Hong Kongers live in tiny, dirty homes sometimes about the size of coffins. Thus, one way or another, Hong Kongers pay for their world-class public transit. Not only in the form of inaccessible housing, but also in the control they inadvertently grant the MTR, and by extension, the government, in deciding where and when they can travel. While fast, cheap, and efficient transit has enabled millions of Hong Kongers to fight for their freedom, it has more recently become a tool to hinder them. Stations in and around protests are regularly closed during the weekends, effectively cutting off most of the population from arriving, and conveniently pinning the blame on protesters for the interruptions. It's a cautionary tale about how indisputably good technology can easily be co-opted in the wrong hands. The solution, though, is better technology. 
When government forces spy on the apps protesters use to communicate, the solution is to build a better, more secure, and encrypted system. To protect against facial recognition, we need to better understand how their neural networks and machine learning algorithms work. And those high-level skills, in addition to many introductory lessons, you can start learning today with Brilliant. This course will take you from the very basics of how computers learn, develop your intuition for why these models work, and build up more modern techniques like adversarial models. In addition to actively learning through solving fun puzzles, you can also interact with these ideas as you apply them. You can use the link in the description to start learning for free, and the first 200 people will get 20% off the annual premium subscription, so you can view all the daily challenges and unlock dozens of problem-solving courses. Thanks to Brilliant, and to you for watching this video.